Good evening. Uh, I am Wildan Taz. I am a general pediatrician. I practice in Arkansas Children's Hospital. Also, I'm an assistant professor in the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. And I teach uh, pediatric residents, family medicine residents, medical students, and PA students. Um, I am also director of the White Tulips Pre-Med and Med Student uh, Mentorship Program. So if you are interested in applying medicine or pre-med uh, pre uh, application, maybe keep in touch. I will uh, give you the email address that you can contact with us. So tonight we're going to talk about, in, first I will talk about why we want to be a doctor, why medicine, and then uh, we have a medical student, Elif, uh, she's a third year medical student uh, in New York City, and she's going to talk about like what the process, how the path is, and what to do and what not to do. So why medicine? That, that's a question that uh, if you're thinking about medicine, you need to ask yourself. And I'm going to talk about like what are the advantages and disadvantages of the medicine and what are the, like, the um, personality uh, types that may fit with medicine. So you may have an idea if you are a good fit for medicine or not after this presentation. I can quickly talk about why I choose medicine. Uh, mine is a little bit of a cliche that I always wanted to be a doctor. When I was in like elementary school, even before when people asked me what do you want to do, I will always say that I want to be a doctor. But in high school, I changed my mind. I really like math. I really like physics. I was in the Olympics like in, back in Turkey. And I decided to be a, like a physics, I do a major in physics and go to NASA. So that was my plan. But before the last year during the, the high school, the in Turkey system is a little bit different. You need to decide if you want to do medicine or not uh, but when you are finishing the high school. There is no like college before medical school in Turkey. It's six years right after high school. So I need to make my mind at that time to do physics or medicine. So I did some search. I, I, I'm not coming from a, like a doctor family, only I had a cousin, he was a surgeon, and I kept asking him all these questions about like medicine, if it's a good fit for me or not. He will just tell me, he will answer my questions, but he will never tell me to do like, do this or do, do, don't do medicine. He, he won't kind of, uh, give me an idea if he wanted to be a doctor or he wanted me to be a doctor or not. So after like searching and asking people questions, I decided to be a doctor and I went to my uncle, uh, cousin and he, I told him that I want to be a doctor. And then he said that, yeah, you made the right decision for you. And it is not because you will have a title. It's not because you, you will have like a lot of money. It's because once you treat a patient, they will tell you, God bless you. And this is everything. So it's worth every like uh, night that you spent sleepless studying or any night that you spend in the hospital. Once they tell you, God bless you, doctor, it's everything that makes it kind of uh, the, the biggest prize. So that was my like decision process, but I will kind of talk about the advantages first. So helping others in an incredibly significant way. Definitely like people are so, vulnerable, they are sick, they need help, and doctor is the person who can help them. So they, you can change their life, you can help them in a, like a very significant way. And if their pain is resolved, if they feel better, then it, it is like a huge thing in their life. And also like sometimes we cannot treat all the disease, we cannot cure all the disease, but we can just like spend their time with them, we can hold their hand, we can kind of walk the path with them when, do, during their sickness. And this makes a huge difference in patient's life. And f on being on the giving side of this like interaction, you also get a lot of from the patients, like you learn from them. And it, it, it is so incredible that you get to help people. And medicine is fascinating. Like if you read about like human body, like smallest muscles like you think about your fingers there are like thousands of like muscles vessels like nerves uh, bones in your just like in small fingers and you think about all your body like it's it's amazing but learning uh, more about medicine is just like so satisfying 
if you like they're, they're so some people think that like medicine is not that scientific because it's more like human interaction it's more social but like the the science of it is so amazing like if you think about the hormones all the regulation in your body like we eat the food we just like swallow it it goes to our stomach and then it's processed and went to our our, our like uh, cells and there are so many different things that's involved during this process and we are still kind of learning about it we we are not even close to know about our body there are so many things that still we don't know there are so many research going on and it is like an endless thing that you i don't think we will have a time that we will say that okay we know everything about human body because it is so complicated and for everyone it's different even like even though we have the same species like human they have like everything kind of similar everybody's body is like different their hormone levels are different they are like uh, kind of processing is different you can in into talking like a, a, in a, per, a doctor's perspective you can prescribe a medic a medication to x person it works very well but you may prescribe the same medication to a z person and it doesn't work well so it is there are a lot of unknowns and learning about it is so fascinating and there is a lot of trust and honor being as a doctor people come and trust you with their health they tell you their biggest secrets they will never tell anybody else the things that they will tell you as a doctor and then they trust with your family i'm a pediatrician so they trust me with their more, more the most precious uh, thing that they ever have like they bring me their newborn baby and i can touch every inch of their baby which they won't let anybody else to do this and then like whenever I am in a kind of community, like even in uh, without my title as a, like a person, as soon as somebody hears that I am a doctor, their trust changed, like their looks are different. They trust me more than before. And there is definitely like a, a lot of honor being a doctor. Like it's when you say that you're a doctor, you feel it. We can influence and there is a respect to doctors. You, you all know Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks that they are, they are like in everybody's house now that whatever they say, people are trying to follow them. But you don't have to be like Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burks. Even like being a, like a doctor in your community, people will ask your opinion. They will um, do what you want them to, to do. It's not just like in medicine, like they may ask their children's sicknesses, they may ask their sicknesses and you, will, you can tell them what to do. They will f respect you and they, they, you can influence them, but also in other things. They, they think that you are kind of in, in a respectful place. Definitely we have this advantage in our uh, communities as doctors. And as a doctor, you never have a dull moment. You see like everyday different people and sometimes like when i see so like different people i say that okay i don't think i can see anything strange than this or weird than this or like more amazing than this and then the next patient is even more amazing or, or more strange so so there is always like a kind of exciting time in medicine you never get bored see you you never feel like you are all doing the same thing so and there are so many like really kind of good memories having this patient. I can tell you one of them, like I, I was um, in residency and I was like an intern. Intern means the, the first year of residency. And it means that you don't know much about your specialty yet. So you don't have a lot of confidence and you have a, like an upper level, a second year or third year resident who helps you when you, are, when you need help. And I was on call that night. And when, when a parent uh, tells the nurse that they want to talk to the doctor, it means that there's something wrong. So there's a problem. And then th that night I was on call and it was one of my first calls as a resident. And a nurse told me that uh, a four year old uh, boy's mother wants to see you. And this four year old was admitted for belly pain and he was having severe belly pain. And I'm like, okay, there's something wrong. And I was worried to go to the room myself. So I got my like upper level, can you come with me and help me if the mom asks me like hard questions I may not be able to answer. So we went to the room together and as soon as I entered the room, this boy turned on the, the TV in the room and there was like music and he was dancing. And then 
mom told me that he got better and now he's able to dance and he wanted to show that to me so it was a really like nice memory not always like uh, scary things happens bad things happens but there's always like so much exciting things happening in our lives and you build really meaningful relationship with your patients especially i'm a primary care physician i get to see the same patient starting from birth to 21 years of age you become a part of that family they they get to see you like every two months every three months quite often and then whenever they are sick they are coming to you so they trust you so it, this is like a real I get a lot of like uh, invitations to high school graduations. My patients, they get graduated from the high school and they want to see me in their graduation. So that's, that's something that it's hard to build. Like you, you, you can build that kind of relationship just with your neighbors or like close school friends. But as a doctor, you can become a part of this family. And believe me, you will know much more about this family than any other neighbor or any other school friend because they tell everything about themselves to you. And then there are so many different opportunities in medicine. It is not just like, I'm a primary care physician. I like to see patients and I see patients in my office. I don't do inpatient. So I, I can choose if, which type of medicine I wanna do. There are like definitely opportunities even if you just want to see patients. But there are some others you can teach. So my half of my time is teaching. I teach in medical school. I teach in physician assistant school. I teach the residents. So if you want to be a teacher and also interested in medicine, that's a great path for you because there are so many teaching opportunities. You can teach nurses. You can teach your other like doctors. Um, so there are so many different opportunities. And then you can work for drug companies. You can like uh, invent new drugs uh, to treat a disease. And also you, I mean, you, right now, all our focus is in this COVID vaccine and it's, it, and the people who are working for drug companies are producing this vaccines. So it's a part of like medicine. And then you can be a researcher. You can do research as a doctor. And um, usually the, the best research are not coming from the, the just researchers, it's coming from researcher doctors because they know the human body very well and they can kind of set up research in a way that's meaningful for um, treating uh, disease. You can even become a lawyer, like a med medical doctor. If they also have a degree in law, then they are like perfect fit for hospitals because there are so many mal malpractice suits going on and there's so many like uh, legal stuff in medicine. So you can be a, like a doctor and a lawyer. You can choose this path. And then there's so many technology. Like, of course, you can become a radiologist, which is the clinical kind of more uh, production part of it. You may uh, create new um, imaging techniques or like new machines to kind of solve problems. Recently, we like the, the people started doing a lot of like 3D printing. They're like 3D printing the heart and like all other organs. And there's a lot of like technical part of it. So you can also, you can get a, like a major in a, in a engineering uh, major, and then you can go to medical school and you can combine this two. That will be great. I mean, we, we recently hired in our hospital, a, like an engineer doctor who is a cardiologist. And uh, like when the baby is born with a heart problem, most of the time these babies are just like four or five pounds. Like imagine a four or five pound old baby and the heart of this baby. It is like we're really tiny, like maybe like a few ounces of a heart, like very small, that big, like, and they are 3D printing of their heart defect. So it's helping with their surgery. Normally they can uh, do that kind of like a surgeries in three or four steps. They need three or four surgeries, but with this 3D printing technology, now they're able to do it in just one surgery. So that's amazing. Like you can be a part of this like life-changing technique. And then there's an IT part of it. There are like a lot of medical records and uh, so many like technologies and the uh, IT part of it. So you become a kind of like a software producer and a doctor and it it will be a great fit for medicine. So there are so many opportunities. You can never say that, oh, okay, I like, like science, I like this, I like this, I cannot be a doctor. Anybody can be a doctor as soon as if they wanted to do it. 
also there's job stability. So moving on to more like material things that it, it's kind of dream job. And if you are not so specific, like if you are not looking for a, like a very specific job, you can find a job in United States as a doctor easily. It's, it's never a problem for a, like a doctor to find a job. And most of the time, people in the hospitals, they want to retain the doctors because the changing doctors is so expensive for hospitals. The whole like search process and then uh, training a new doctor to their system and kind of building up a practice with the new doctor, it's so expensive for hospitals. As soon as you don't have a major problem, usually they want to keep you. The only reason of changing jobs in medicine is that you want to change it. It's not because you are getting fired from jobs. So it's a very stable job. And then there's high compensation. Of course, this depends on which specialty you are. Like the surgeons, generally, they make more money. Primary care is the lowest most of the time. But it, like the, even the lowest salaries, they start with six digits. And then for surgeons, there are like some of them going seven digits. It requires the critical thinking and problem solving. That this is one thing that I heard from a lot of people that the medicine is more kind of like you memorize things, you don't think a lot. It is not true. Like every patient is a, like a question. It, you need to solve this. It's a puzzle. You need to put pieces together. You need to ask the great questions to be able to get the, the best history. And then you need to do the best physical exam to be able to get the parts of the the problem and then you need to think about what it could be put all the like the pieces together and find the diagnosis and then you need to think about the treatment so there's a lot of critical thinking going on a lot of problem solving going on it's not just memorizing things and kind of memorizing name of the medications it's not that simple and as i mentioned before like every patient is different so there is like a lot of um out of the textbook things going on like Every day, at least once a day, I need to look, go search for something because it is something that doesn't fit with any textbook diagnosis or any textbook kind of definition. So there are a lot of uh, investigation going on in medicine. And then we have, the, we have the ability to empower patients to take control of their health and their lives. So if you can motivate a teenager to eat healthy and do exercise, this impacts their whole life. Like it changes them. Like rather than being obese, having a healthy weight, it's gonna change all their pet. They are not gonna have all the complications related to obesity. Or like giving immunizations as a pediatrician, I'm more talking about the, the pediatric part of it, but giving immunization will prevent them having severe infections and then complications of these infections. And then they, if they, you can get them motivated to other things. Like I see a lot of like school age children, teenagers, if I can get them motivated to study their, like, like um, do their homeworks, kind of be more motivated at school, then it changes their lives. I have this ability that, to empower my patients and also their families. Coming to downsides, it's a long education. So this is from the last in-person medical school graduation. This is our, like some people from our department that most of the people who were graduating were 27, 28 years old. So most of the time they go to college and then they may take a few gap years and then they go to medical school. So it takes a long time. Well, some, for some people, they wanna be like uh, making money. They wanna be, be kind of, they hear their life set as soon as possible after college, which with medicine is like, it's a little bit difficult. They have extra four years of education and most of the time they may need to take gap years to be able to kind of complete their CVs uh, to go to medical school. And then there is this malpractice part of it that mistakes, we are human, anybody can make mistakes. So it may cause malpractice lawsuits, but I don't want to scare you with this. This is something, it usually happens with miscommunication. If you communicate well with your patients or like your in generally in your team, this won't happen very often for you. And with all this responsibility, like taking care of a human body, like taking care of babies or children for me, it, it's very stressful because you have a lot of burden on your uh, shoulders that if you make a mistake, it may cost a life. If you make a mistake, it can cause disability. So there's a lot of stress. 
and burnout in medical fields. Uh, doctors, being a doctor is the highest risk factor for, um, it's one of the highest, I, I don't want to say just highest, but like it's one of the highest uh, professional, uh, uh, professional uh, specialty to commit suicide. But I think that this is not a problem for everyone, this burnout, because if you like what you are doing and if you really want to help people and solve their problem, and this is the main purpose of being a doctor, I think you don't get burnout. But if the only reason is to get a title, if only reason is to make more money, then you get burned out because there are so many other things that, so many other responsibilities that may not worth just the money, that may not worth the title, but if all your purpose is to help people, then it's definitely worth all the stress and kind of difficulties. Just talking a little bit about the pediatrics, since I'm a pediatrician, I, I will advertise my specialty. It's, I think, the most exciting area of medicine because it in, involves the genetics, it involves the preventive medicine. Uh, as I mentioned, we given can change their life. And there's a growing and changing body. So every time you see them, they are different. And it, it's so amazing to see this change. And it's the core of the adult life and health. Like any, think that happens as a baby, it affects all their whole life. So you have the ability to kind of shape their life. And being a part of a, ch a children's life is amazing. They are always, like, they, they never fake. If they're sick, they're sick. If they're not sick, they will be jumping around. You will know it. And they love you and they, they will bring you like as a, like a doc, um, they will bring you their uh, pictures or they may kind of make you, um, special gifts and this this is so fun like having a job that in includes children and you get to spend time with them you play with them definitely you examine them and you see them sometimes when they are sick but most of the time the kids are kind of healthy so we are lucky 95 percent of the children are healthy and then you work with a, like a, a family that who likes to work with children and it makes them more kind of nice in general, among the, uh, uh, among the medical specialties, pediatrics is the nicest. We are like, uh, we have a good repetition among medical students that we are the nicest uh, doctors that they work with. So it is a nice part of my job. And this is our like email address, premed at whitetulip.org and medstudent at whitetulip.org. If you have any questions, if you want to apply to a medical school, then you can contact us. Okay, now Elif will present uh, how you can get into medical school part. Yes, I'm going to take over your screen in a second. Okay. Can everybody see? Yes, we can. Let me just go back to the beginning. Okay, so now that everybody is excited to become a doctor, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the path to get there and um, some specifics. And I mentioned this before, but if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box and then we'll look at the end. Um, and answer any questions that you have. Um, so this is about the do's and don'ts um, on the journey of pre-med, of your pre-med life, basically. Um, I'm gonna be talking mostly about the do's. Um, the don'ts are kind of implied um, and we'll go through them uh, throughout the presentation. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about pre-med math, <laughs> which is something that everybody loves. Um, but this isn't your typical math. It's basically a breakdown of what um, pre-med looks like here in the States. So it's four years of undergrad, which I'm sure you guys all know of, about. Um, and then you do four years of medical school. Um, and then you do a residency program. And this is something that um, Dr. Tess mentioned. but Basically, um, this is the way that you train as a doctor after you have graduated from medical school. So you're a doctor, everybody calls you doctor, but you're still learning, you're still a student. 
Um, and in fact, as you go into this profession, you learn that um, it's a profession of constant learning. So you're always a student in some way or another. Um, and so that is the equation that leads to doctor. But there are many ways to get to this path. Um, um, as we had mentioned before, there are, there are places that you can add time into. Um, for example, this is what I did. I did graduate school between undergrad and medical school. Um, a lot of people will take some time off. We'll do some volunteering. Um, we'll go into experiences that maybe um, benefit their application some way or another, or just are things that they found um, very valuable in undergrad and decided to pursue before they started medical school. So um, this is like a changing formula, um, but it's definitely something that um, is a, a good place to start. Um, and so we're just talking about the requirements of the pre-med track. Um, a lot of schools uh, do it differently, but this is kind of a breakdown of what it looks like in a standard undergraduate school. Um, I went to Rutgers University, which is a school in New Jersey, and this is kind of what it looks like for most students. Um, and so you can see these are the requirements. You have to have biology, chemistry, organic chemistry, and so on. And this is kind of a breakdown of the numbers are um, the credit hours. So at the end of the day, it kind of adds up to um, a major of biology, which is why you would find a lot of um, pre-med students go into um, the bio major track. But that's not to say that this is the only way to be a pre-med. Um, as long as you have these requirements and you meet these requirements, you are considered a pre-med and you are able to apply to medical school. Um, it's just that you would have to had, add these on to whatever other major you choose. A lot of people go into whatever their passion is. And you may realize that I didn't give a requirement for like what type of school or what university or that you have to go to an Ivy League or so on and so forth. At the end of the day, the point is that you go to a school that works for you, um, and I'm talking about undergraduate school, that works for you and um, you make the most of it. You earn a GPA that is sufficient, meaning it's good, and you take these requirements and whatever major you choose to pursue, as long as you add these onto it, you are considered a pre-med and you can apply to medical school, as I said. And um, at the bottom where it says psychology, sociology, and so on, these are just additional requirements that most medical schools these days are starting to require. Um, psychology and sociology is something that's ever-changing. Um, we're adding to these fields every, every decade and so on. So the more integrated you are in in, uh, and well-rounded you are in fields outside of medicine, the better perspective you have of you know, what it takes to be a person who interacts with humans on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so in addition to the pre-med requirements, which are the course requirements, there are some other requirements that you need to meet um, in order to, to have an acceptance at the end of the day. Um, Things that a lot of students do are shadowing. So um, I thought this picture kind of really depicts a shadowing student. Basically, you're standing in their field and you're watching them from a corner, not interacting, just watching quietly and seeing what they do. Um, this is kind of the first thing that most students will do. And then there's also scribing, which is where you're playing more of an active role in, in the form of interacting with the doctor. So the doctor will tell you, you know, I want you to write so-and-so, you follow the doctor around, you write what they say, and that helps the um, doctor finish up their notes. Um, and it helps you to learn what it takes to write a note. And that's something that'll, that is be beneficial when you become a medical student because it's a skill that um, is taught and learned um, and is perfected as you go on. And then volunteering is just something that, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but this form of volunteering is something that's way more active and you have to be able to play a role in the, care, in the patient care team. And what that means is that you're talking with the patient themselves, um, you are interacting with them, you're asking them questions, you're getting a sense of what it means to be a doctor. You're trying to understand whether or not 
this is what is meant for you. And the only way to do that is to interact with patients um, in a setting which is in the medical field. And they say that anything um, where you basically can smell the patient is close enough to be considered a volunteering activity. Um, and so being at that level with the patient, interacting with them is definitely valuable and definitely something that you want to have on your record. Um, so there are many ways that you can become a doctor and that you can become um, a medical student. So the two main ways it, you could become a doctor is um, pursuing an MD program or pursuing a DO program. And these are basically the same thing. Um, they're both, I'm sorry, somebody has their uh, mic on, I think. Okay, so you can basically um, attend um, a DO program or MD program to become a physician in the United States. And they're the same thing um, with the addition in the DO programs that you learn um, specific osteopathic manipulative medicine. Um, and I am in a DO program, so that's something that I learned. And maybe something that if you're interested in, we could talk about at a, at a future date. But um, at the end of the day, they're both physicians and the way to get there um, to those medical schools can be varied. So um, the, the standard traditional way is to do the four years of undergrad and then you take your MCAT and then you apply and you do four years of medical school. Another way you can um, go to medical school is by doing a seven year program. That's where you apply as a high school student to a program such as a BSMD or a BSDO, and you do three years of um, undergrad and then you do four years of medical school. And these programs have um, some requirements where you need to take certain classes or maintain certain GPAs and um, meet with peers at certain time points and things like that. But um, it's definitely a good option to consider if you're, if you're somebody who is in high school and you know, really wants to pursue this um, path and wants to save a year or two. Um, and then there are other programs that are eight-year programs. And then um, as Dr. Tass mentioned, there are programs where they are actually dual degrees. So MBJD is the one where you become a, a doctor and a lawyer. Um, you could also be an MD PhD, which is someone who plays more of an active role in um, the field of research and science. Um, a PharmD MD is um, a person who is a pharmacist and an MD. So that gives you more of a, a perspective into the field of medicine and medications. Um, and this image is just to show that there are different flavors of pathways to, and how to get there. Um, and at times, this is how it feels. Um, I'm sure a lot of high school students feel this way. Uh, I know a lot of undergrad students feel this way, and I can say as a medical student, I still sometimes feel this way. But at the, um, at the end of the day, I think it's all a matter of perspective. You know where you're trying to get to. Um, and as long as you have the support network and um, community that can get you out of <laughs> this house of fire, um, it's really a valuable experience and something that is, um, you know, just worth it in the end. Um, so here are my do's and don'ts. Um, the main do's um, are to manage your commitments. This is something that I wish somebody told me um, in the beginning of undergrad. I just went to college and started jumping into everything, all the clubs, all the activities, all the student, like, social things um, and it became a lot. And I think that's something that is just an exciting part of college in general, but it's something that you can really get lost in um, and something that you need to manage, which is why I wrote it there multiple times. Um, another really important thing is to collaborate with people who are around you. Um, you're gonna meet lots of pre-meds. Um, they're all gonna be very ambitious and everybody is going to want to get to the same place um, and you know everybody might have the same goal but the point is that if you collaborate um, it's just a means to get to where you want to go together um, and I think that's kind of why I put this picture there so I don't know if you some people might be familiar with the New York City area but if you're taking the five train or the six train 
and so your friend is taking the Q train, you, you guys might, might both, you know, cross paths at Canal Street, but you're splitting at the end and, you know, your destinations are different. The way you get to medicine might be different than the way that your friend gets to medicine. Maybe you take another year, maybe they take another two years. You know, it's not, a, it's not a comparison story. It's about your own journey and how you choose to take that journey. And um, you, where you end up is where you're meant to be. Um, that's something that, you know, I've, I have to keep in my mind constantly as well. Um, but don't compare yourself to others. Just know that, you know, when you need um, support, you have you have it there and that's why i said seek out mentors ask for help um just have that support network because there are going to be times when you feel like you're in that house of fire but reaching out to that network is something that will help you um, get back on track um the last thing on the do's i put is to be professional at, at all times i think that's something that is needed to be said um, especially for kids in our generation. Um, everybody has social media, everybody has, you know, a social presence, everybody has a presence in the real world. Um, and just realize that that presence can follow you wherever you go. Um, nothing on the internet is deletable, everything is permanent. Just have that mindset and realize that what you put out there um, is a reflection of yourself and potentially is a reflection of what people will see when you're applying to whatever path you're applying to. Um, then in my don'ts, I said, don't compete with your peers. That kind of goes back to collaborating. You don't want to have that sense of, you know, competition where people are trying to get on top of each other to, the, to, get, to achieve their goal. Um, this is something that unfortunately is very um, prominent in undergraduate um, institutions, especially in the pre-med world, but you'll find that once you get to medical school, um, that kind of all disappears because, you know, essentially everybody is where they want to be, but unfortunately some people um, do have that competitive nature which will um, kind of push other people down and you don't want to be that person. Um, I talked about not comparing yourself to others because it's your own journey. Um, don't give up. <laughs> this is just something that is not said enough. Don't give up. Like, there are many times that you can falter. You might fail a class. I certainly failed a class. I'm, I'm in medical school. Um, you might get pushed down. You might fall. You know, all these things. Um, just know that there have been people who were in your position and got to where they wanted to be. Um, and that also ties, ties into don't become defeatist. Um, which means don't be so quick to um, accept failure. Um, a lot of people will tell you, you know, you're not good enough for medical school. Why are you a pre-med? Why do you think this? Why do you think that? It's really um, none of their business, first of all. And if you know that um, you want something uh, strong enough and you're passionate in this field, there will always be somebody who can help you to get you to get you to your goal. Um, and if you are reaching out to mentors or people who are telling you that you're not gonna be able to make it, find new ones, just find new ones. There is somebody out there who wants to help you. Um, these are some resources that I loved um, that helped me a lot and helped me during my application process to medical school, um, but it's definitely something that I wish I listened to, but I don't think it existed back then, but could have listened to as an undergrad student. Um, the pre-med year specialty stories and short cook podcast are all um, podcasts that are free, readily available. You can watch or listen anywhere. And um, yeah, they have lots of good advice. Some are short, some are long. You could pick and choose what you want. And I think it's a great place to start. I didn't want to overwhelm any of you with lots of resources, but this is definitely a place where um, you can get a little bit more, um, some more ideas about where to go from here. Um, and then this down here is my email, and we already um, wrote down the email for White Tulip in the chat box. So if you guys have any questions um, after this session, you can feel free to reach out to us there. Um, and we, we can answer some questions um, in the chat box now as well.
I'm going to stop this share. Okay. Um, Vildan Abla, are you able to see the questions as well? I, don't, I, I can't hear you. You're on mute, I think. <laughs> Sorry, I muted myself and I forgot. So there is a question about at what year of medical school does one interact with people and patients? I can answer this question. Like typically it's the third year of the medical school, but most of the medical schools are now implementing a kind of preceptorship in the first and second year that they can go and work with a doctor in their office or the, in, like w w whatever their specialty in the hospital. So they get to see patients even in the first year of the medical school. So most of the schools are, I think they're now starting at the first year of the medical school. Okay, I see a question about um, asking about what, when do you decide what type of doctor you want to be? So um, I'm a third year medical student and I still don't know what type of doctor I want to be. I kind of have an idea, but you can go into medical school having an idea and then that might change. So um, essentially you have to have an open mind, um, but if you have a passion, that's something that you can pursue um, and you know work on that track. You don't necessarily have to um, know it from the get-go. Um, in addition to that, I think that person also asked um, if you determine in, in med school, do you take classes that has to do with that profession? No, everybody in medical school basically takes the same classes. Um, everybody does the same rotation. So what a rotation is, is basically um, as a medical student, you go in um, and um, basically are a practice doctor. So you go and practice and you um, talk to the patients um, and you do that in all in the major fields. And that gives you an idea of what type of doctor you want to be. And does it have to be three years of residency or can it be less? Three years is actually the minimum. It can go up to six years if you want to be a neurosurgeon. <laughs> so three years is the minimum. It can't be less it's than that. It's seven years to some programs for seven oh. years for neurosurgery. <laughs> yes, it's a very long path. But three years, else? three to four years is, the, is general. Mm -hmm. If there's a question, is the seven year program really worth it? I heard some people had problems with it. Problems that include not being able to finish it efficiently or having dropout. I'm not sure. Is it like you mean the residency as a seven year program or combined pre med and med? I think they mean the pre med and the med program. Um, it depends on what program you go to. Um, I'm not sure which specific program you're referring to, but I think it's definitely worth it. Um, if you get accepted into one of those programs, it's a essentially a one-way ticket to medical school if you can achieve those, you know, the GPA, the requirements that they that they tell you to do. Um, it's it's an easier way to get in. Some schools um, don't even have you take the MCAT, so I think that's a good um, indication of you know that's a motivation factor for sure. Um, but, you know, essentially it's up to the person. If you go in and you're able to perform well um, and um, meet the requirements, yes, I, I would say seven years is definitely worth it. Which schools do you recommend? I'm not sure if that refers to undergraduate or um, to undergrad or uh, the medical schools themselves, but in terms of undergrad, like I said, you can be in any undergrad school um, and go to any medical school from there. In terms of what schools for medical school that I recommend, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You just have to go to a medical school, do well, figure out what you want, and you become a doctor. Um, what are some things that you recommend us to do in high school that will benefit us? So things to do in high school, um, definitely reach out to people around you who are physicians. That can be your own doctor. That can be, you know, a small doctor's office that is around the corner from your house or like in, in, the, near, in a nearby neighborhood um, and doing shadowing, which is what I said was like the, you, you just stand in the corner and watch. That's the first step. Um, another thing you could do um, is listen to those podcasts. They give lots of great advice. Um, 
for how to start and where to go from there. Um, somebody said that they're, they're concerned um, about being, an, being a senior, but their SAT is, or is poor. I wouldn't, you know, if you're going to be able to get into college and you're going to be able to meet those requirements in college, um, don't think that a poor SAT score is going to keep you from being a medical student and being, from being a doctor, no way. That's not, you're like at the very beginning of the race. You have, you know, a long way to go, yeah, but um, you are not disqualified. I don't know if I missed any questions. Do you think that yeah, there's one more. Just came. Can you change your residency when you start one? Yes, technically you can start your, uh, you can change your residency. We have like residents, I had like two of them in last few years that they started family medicine residency, but they wanted to be a pediatrician. So they switched to pediatrics and definitely you can change residency, but it is a little bit difficult. I mean, depends on what you want to change. You, if you are a, like a pediatrician and you want to be a neurosurgeon, it may not work as well. But if you want to switch in between family medicine, internal medicine, or family medicine, pediatrics, then it, 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 it definitely you can change it. But you need to apply from the beginning. You need to apply for residency and get match. So it, it's possible, but not that easy. Somebody asked, which class did you come to America and how old were you? Um, I don't know if this is asking about me specifically, but I was, I was born here, so I can't really answer that question. <laughs> but um, yeah. I know that people come here at all levels. I know somebody who came here um, after graduating high school in Turkey, came here to the United States, did their you know, undergraduate degree and did well enough to go to medical school. So don't think that, you know, um, learning a new language is gonna, you know, keep you from, um, from essentially applying and doing what you want. I don't think that that should be a factor that you have to consider as a barrier. Um, someone said, is there such a thing as general medicine? So I guess the only way I can answer that is by saying that in terms of general medicine, um, two fields come to mind. Family medicine is something that sees a lot of general medicine and so is internal medicine. So um, those two fields uh, see a lot of different types of medical issues, medical diseases, things like that. Um, I think somebody else had asked, oh yes, um, in high school, where, when do you start taking APs? That's a good question um, because a lot of those pre-med requirements can actually be completed as a high school student. Um, the way you do that is by taking APs. So let's say that you took AP Biology um, and you got the score that your university um, accepts that as credit. So that would essentially take the place of um, the requirement that you had to take biology for. So you can um, either finish school early or you can uh, have that requirement as be considered as um, you know, a pass fail. So if you have the credits, you it's a pass, so it doesn't get factored into your GPA, um, which means that if you took hard classes, um, it's less likely to um, impact your GPA in, in undergrad, which is something they do take into consideration. Um, when do you start making money? You start making money after you finish <laughs> under, after you finish um, basic, <laughs> not undergrad. <laughs> after you finish medical school as a resident um, but it's basically like a it's a small salary um, it's kind of like a we appreciate you being here type of salary um, it's enough to get you by but it's not the doctor salary that everybody thinks it is um, once you finish your residency that's when you start making a doctor salary what do you think about studying abroad in Europe or the Middle East um, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to in terms of medicine. Um, you know, studying medicine abroad is something that people do do. Um, they will go to medical school in a different country. 
but then once they graduate medical school in order to practice as a physician in the United States, they would have to um, apply to residency as an international student. And that is something that makes it difficult to um, gain acceptance into residency programs. Um, and then I will talk more about that. <laughs> yeah. Like it, being an U.S. graduate is always like puts you ahead of the other international graduates, but it's it's possible. I have a lot of friends who were born here, like uh, grown up here, and then they went to Pakistan or India, went to medical school, and then came back. But like your application will be limited to the programs who accept international medical graduates. Some school they don't even accept any medical graduate, international medical graduates, and then. Uh, their criteria is different. You need to get higher USMLE scores, which is a, like a, a exam that you need to take regardless you are a, like an American graduate or international graduate, but an American graduate can have a, like a 220 and enter the same residency, but you have to have 250 to be able to enter the same residency. So it makes things a little bit harder, but it's possible. There are a lot of people who are doing it. Definitely it's cost effective. Like it's, it costs, less going to medical school in Middle East because it's almost free over there. Yes, and that was another question. What is the average cost? Um, in terms of cost for school, if you were to add up all of those costs, you have to take into consideration, um, did you go to a, a state school in undergrad? Did you go to a private school in undergrad? Did you go to community college in undergrad? Um, you know, the loans from those plus medical school, um, you can't pay it out of pocket. You have to be taking loans. Um, and the average is around $200,000 um, for medical school. Uh, but it's something that you take out your loan and then once you finish school, you pay um, as you go along and you do make enough money to pay that in the end. So um, it shouldn't be something that is like a major barrier um, if you're okay with taking out the loans. Um, which college would you recommend for dentistry or orthodontist? So I'm not really familiar with the dental um, pathway because I do know that um, a lot of pre-meds um, do go on to apply to um, dental school and many of the uh, prereq prerequisites are the same. Um, but I think essentially the answer is the same. If you go to any old undergrad, any state school, anywhere ever, and you do well, you have a good GPA, and you take your exams, you have all the prereqs, that is what you need to get to where you are. Um, obviously, you have to take into consideration, does this program have the major that I want to do? Is this cost effective for me? Is it close to my family? Is it far from my family? Things like that. So I think it's a really in the, um, personal question. Um, but if you want more guidance about that, that you can definitely reach out. Uh, somebody asked if the MCAT is as hard as they say it is. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard exam. <laughs> You're going to be taking hard exams your whole life if you want to down this pathway. The MCAT is not the last exam that you'll be taking for sure, but it's like all exams. If you study well, you prepare well, you will do well. <laughs> if you don't study, if you are distracted, if you don't put in the time and effort that you need, you will not do well. So um, yeah, you, you, get, you get what you put in. Yeah, and as a doctor, if you want to be a doctor, you need to get used to taking exams because it, it never ends. I'm a pediatrician and every five years I need to take a board exam to be able to maintain my certificate, otherwise I cannot practice. So it's like starting from pre-med, MCAT, USMLEs, and then your board exam. So you're going to always take exams. <laughs> Does the ranking of the undergrad university matter for getting into a good medical school? No, not at all, not at all. The ranking of your undergraduate school is not what determines um, whether you get into a good medical school or not. Um, what determines that, like I said, are the prereqs, the MCAT score, obviously, and you know your extracurricular activities and 
how well you can sell yourself. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, the ranking doesn't and matter. Actually, uh -huh. And sometimes going to a really good, like a kind of highly ranked undergraduate may affect you. I mean, it may be a, like a negative for you because your GPA cannot be as high as the other like community colleges and it may affect you like i have i know a few people who went to rice it's a, like a great undergraduate in texas houston and they are they were rejected from the medical schools because of their gpas and then the other people who went to not that highly ranked um colleges that they were accepted to medical school so it's it's really your gpa and your performance doing the pre-med is more important than where you went uh i had a private question how was the work hours affected your relationships and happiness so the, the good thing about like being a doctor is like definitely during the medical school you need to work hard and then the residency you need to work hard but after residency you can decide how much you want to work it really like if you want to make less money and work less yeah definitely you can do that it's it's really up to you you can build your own practice you, you can decide which days you want to work which days you don't want to work so it you can ha you have control uh in your like um work hours and also like if you are doing something that you like you enjoy your job then when you are home you spend the rest of the time like happy and it actually affects your relationship in a positive way and as a like a medical student and a resident you learn time management and I, I know a lot of people who work less than me, but they achieve like less during their time of time. So I think you, you uh, become like managing your time better than most of the other people. And you, most of the time your relationships and you're more happy because you, you, you can control your time. I mean, I don't think it's negatively affected me. I, I have two children, I am married and I have a lot of so other social life. I do other things. And I don't think I don't see my job as a like a kind of burden or like something preventing me doing fun things. I think the opposite actually. Since I know how to manage my time, that I, when I work, I'm at work, but the rest of the time I can like do other things. Um, how is your I'm social life of, back there? I'm getting a lot of um, private questions about. Um, a pathway so somebody asked what is the prereq so those are the classes that you need to take in order to apply to medical school you have to take those classes and those are the classes i listed um and we can share that information with you um as well if you need it um somebody asked uh when do you start volunteering and for how long do you have to volunteer you could start as a high school student um you can start as an undergrad student um the hours that you volunteer if if it's consistent, it's enough. Um, let's say you volunteer, you know, for three hours a week or two hours a week, um, but you've been doing it for, you know, several months. That's more valuable than doing, you know, 50 hours in one week, let's say. Um, so definitely consistency is important um, and you can start it whenever, as early as possible, basically. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, dentistry and things like that. I don't know specifically a lot about the dentistry pathway. I do want to say that like pre-med is more of a concept than it is like a major. So um, a lot of pre-med students will be biology majors, um, you know, psychology majors, things like that. So or chemistry majors. Um, so you can be a pre-med and be, you know, a history major, for example. Um, but if you have those classes and your plan is to achieve your plan is to apply to medical school, you are a pre-med. Um, and if you are, you know, planning to apply to dent dentistry school, you are pre-dental. So the, the classes that you take um, are going to be similar for sure. Um, I'm, I don't know exactly the prerequisites for dentistry though. There's a question. Do I need to take the MCAT if I'm planning to be a nurse practitioner? No, it is a different path. You need to go to a nursing school and then there, like, you need to kind of get the credential to be able to be a nurse practitioner. And the nurse practitioner is like addition to the nursing school. They do one or two years of like rotations and extra kind of uh, work. And then they become nurse practitioners. MCAT is not a part of it. 
Uh, somebody asked if they take into consideration um, which uh, medical school you graduated from when you become a doctor um, in terms of, you know, where you can um, find a job. Um, I would say no. Uh, I don't think the medical school that you go to determines what, where you can practice. Um, what determines that is if you passed um, your exam, if you are a licensed professional, and what kind of salary you're willing to take from wherever you apply for a job. Yeah, 100% agree. Like it, it more depends on where you did your residency and even like you can do your residency any place and then you can start working any area or any kind of like a place. It's really like multifactorial. It's not just like you did residency there, then you can only go this places. It's so complicated. <laughs> Someone um, asked me privately, is, where can I get recording from? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. This is like, there is a, like a technical question. Where can I get the recording from? They asked me privately. Uh -huh. So maybe NSPA can help with this. Uh, we will post this on uh, YouTube. So they will be able to reach from YouTube. Um, somebody asked, could you compare a straight A student in high school with an AP and dual enrollment classes to medical school. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to ask, but basically if you're a straight A student in high school, yes, that's a perfectly great thing. Um, APs, again, helps you in terms, of, um, in terms of not having to take those requirements in college and then if you have those APs and you have those straight A's, um, you should apply to the dual program because you have um, things that they're looking for, um, things that will help you. So I don't know, I hope that answers it. Like there is one thing that like high school grades are important for pre-med. Pre-med grades are important for medical school. Like after pre-med, the high school scores are not that important. And then like they don't go back and look further back. Like after the med school, only med school grades are important. What you have done in pre-med is not that important for the residency. So it's like stepwise, yes, high school grades are so important for pre-med, but then after pre-med, your high school scores are, they're not gonna look at it. They, they, they won't go back and look at it. So there is a private question to me. What do, which classes I need to take for neurosurgery? So it is a, like a decision that you're gonna do after medical school for pre-meds, like may, you may do neuroscience, it may be kind of plus for you, but otherwise like any pre-med and then medical school, during the medical school, you, you need to do some things for neurosurgery. Like you may work with a neurosurgeon, do research. But I think before medical school, Maybe as a major, you can have neuroscience, but even if you, you don't have it, it's, it's okay. You can do any kind of pre-med. Yes, I completely agree with that. Um, it really just depends on how well your scores are after you become a medical student. Um, we can continue to answer questions. Um, if you, if you know, uh, if that works for everybody else who you know wants to stay, but you can also reach out to us um, in the contact information we provided as well. Um, somebody asked, during the last two years of medical school, do you get to pick the rotations you want to do, and do rotations include all fields of medicine such as neurosurgery? Um, that's a good question. You're thinking very far into the future. I like that. Um, basically, um, the last two years of medical school, you um, do resident, you do um, rotations in the major fields. So you would have to do it in family medicine. You have to do it in pediatrics, emergency medicine, um, surgery, OBGYN, um, things like that. Uh, psychology as well. And then your fourth year, what you can do is you apply for um, uh, rotations that are more specific to your interests. So that's, for example, when you would maybe do a rotation in neurosurgery. Um, and essentially, 
you can kind of pick and choose for fourth year, but you don't pick for third year. How's medical school interview, how do medical school interviews go? And can you get eliminated based on a poor interview? Yes, definitely. Um, I think that talking to people, how you interact with people is very important in this field. You have to be able to, um, you know, put your ideas across and have people understand it in a way where they're not offended and they're not hurt. And you have to talk like you're speaking with patients um, in a respectful manner. And that's something that people pay attention to very early on um, in your career. So I'm sure people do get into, uh, rejected due to poor interviewing, um, but it's a skill like any other thing in medicine and it's something that you can practice. And if you have the right resources, um, you can master that skill. So as long as you practice um, and you're able to speak and get your ideas across, um, and you have everything else that you, you need to get to be there, then I don't think you need to worry about it very much. Somebody asked, I'm a senior student and I want to be a dentist, but I don't know which major I should choose to be able to continue after undergrad. Um, I would look into this um, on your own because, as I said, I don't really know much about dental process, but um, it's like the pre-med pathway for sure. So you can be any major um, as long as you get in the pre-requirements, such as the biology, you know, um, the biology courses, the chemistry courses, things like that. Um, and depending on which dental school you want to go to, um, something you could do, and this applies to medical schools as well, you can go on their admissions page, so you just type in the school and then you write admissions, and that'll tell you a breakdown of um, which specific classes you need to take, which requirements they have, um, so that'll be more specific to what you, you're interested in. Guys, we can have a few, like if you've lost questions and we can finish like 8.10 or 8.15. Um, we also have a white tulip dentistry group. So if you're interested in dentistry, um, you can reach out to us um, via the email provided and we can give you the right contact information to have um, basically the network that you need to get in contact with. If you don't get a really good score on step one, can you make it up by doing very well in step two and three? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm just in the beginning of this process, so I can't really say for sure. <laughs> it depends on what specific field you're interested in. Um, but I don't think anything in medicine is like clear cut. You know, you're, you're banned from ever being like a medical uh, or a doctor or whatever. So, I mean, there's always room for improvements. And if you show that improvement, um, I, I'm sure someone will appreciate that. And you can apply to the field that you're interested in. Um, somebody asked if you're able to take MCAT multiple times, like you are able to take the SAT. Yes, you can. You can take MCAT multiple times. Um, my understanding is that now, or I don't know if it was like that in the, in the past, but SAT, you can pick and choose which scores you want to send. But if you take the MCAT, um, they will see all the scores that you have taken in the past, which can be a good and bad thing. Um, you know, they might see that you improved, but they might also see that you took MCAT eight times, which is not um, the best thing in the world. But yeah, you can take it multiple times. I know plenty of people who've taken it more than once. Okay, I'm not seeing any new questions. If we skipped your question, you could type it again um, and we'll try to get to it in this last five minutes. And also as said, this video is recorded and we will publish it on YouTube. So if no one else have questions, we can finish it or we can wait until 
for uh, Eastern time, 9.15, and then finish it then. It's according to our listeners. Um, somebody asked, how is med school mentally and emotionally, and is it a lot of stress? Um, mentally and emotionally, it can be like that burning house on fire sometimes. Um, but, you know, I feel like I've said this a lot of times and I really do mean it, but if you have a good support network, if you have people there who are collaborating with you and working with you and helping you out and supporting you and, you know, boosting you when you feel down, emotionally and mentally, it can be, you know, the biggest boost. So you just have to build that, you know, support network from the beginning. Don't you know, don't wait to, to build it later. Just work as you go to build that up because um, at times that can be your biggest resource. Yeah. One thing Edith mentioned in her presentation to not to compare yourself with peers. If you go to medical school or any kind of like a school that you need to study, don't compare with your others. Like you may see everybody like doing fun things, but you have to study. If you compare, you may feel kind of depressed but otherwise like what other useful way are you going to use your time like i think studying or like learning human body or like kind of working for your dream job or whatever like i think it's the most useful way of using your time and what else would you do like differently if you have the time are you going to waste it i think this is a question that you can ask yourself and decide does it worth spending that time studying or you want to do something more useful? To me, it was studying was the most useful thing. <laughs> I think that's something that I didn't hear enough of when I was an undergrad because I always wanted to have fun and do social things and, you know, hang out with my friends. And yeah, if I could go back, would I study more? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. Um, and that's something that, you know, you always you'll always remember and think about, you know, if I had put in more effort before, if I had put in more effort two years ago, if I had, you know, and so on. So definitely um, put in the effort now because you don't want to be in that position two years, four years down the line thinking, you know, I wish I had studied better. I wish I had studied more. Um, because essentially it's a pathway that you're going to be on and the results are, you know, the results are come from what you put into it. Um, and yeah, I would just take that into consideration. What's the best motivation you had or did to not quit or drop out of medical school? <laughs> Thankfully, I never had the thought process of dropping out of medical school. I feel like if I started, <laughs> if I put myself in that position, I, I might have gone down a hole. Um, but I think just being motivated by the people around me, you know, we said don't compare yourself to others, but let other people's excitement for this field bring you up. Um, let other people's, you know, dedication and work inspire you. Um, let that be not a source of comparison, but more a source of, you know, growth. You know, you want to grow with these people. You want to achieve things with these people. And the more you do it together, the more it is beneficial for everybody. So um, I feel like the best source of motivation is definitely your peers. Um, the second greatest source of motivation is your future patients. If you think about, you know, the actions that you take and how that will affect the people that you will be seeing in the future. Um, I feel like that's the best kind of motivation for sure. I'm not seeing any new questions. It's 9.14, I guess. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tuss and uh, Mr. Zeller, uh, for this amazing uh, presentation and the question answering. And if there's no more questions, I believe we can end it right here. Yeah, everybody, thank you for thank you. It was joining us. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>